All right, so we'll go ahead and jump in as folks continue to join us in our virtual room. Hi everyone, I'm Julia, a bookseller with Politics and Prose. We are live for our Arcadia Publishing Night, discussing culture and community in the capital city. You can follow the link in the chat to purchase Black Broadway in Washington, DC, Berry Farm, Hillsdale, and Anacostia, a historic African-American community, and Washington, DC housing co-ops, directly from us at Politics and Prose. If you have a question for our speakers, please use the Q&A feature found at the bottom of your screen. We'll move to questions in the last portion of the discussion, though we apologize in advance if we run short on time. And before we jump in, we do want to sincerely thank all of you out there for joining us. We are so grateful to our family of loyal customers keeping our business and our spirits afloat. It's my pleasure to introduce our speakers. Author of Black Broadway in Washington, D.C., Brianna A. Thomas has been published in Washingtonian Magazine, the historic Afro-American newspaper, and the Washington Post throughout her journalism career. Brianna earned a Master of Journalism degree from the University of Maryland College Park and a Bachelor of Arts degree in English and Communications from Greensboro College. She is the co-senior pastor of a Maryland-based multi-site church, Open Bible Ministries. Author of Berry Farm Hillsdale and Anacostia, a historic African-American community, Alcione M. Amos is currently a museum curator at the Smithsonian Institution Anacostia Community Museum in Washington, DC. Originally from Brazil, she has lived and worked in the United States for almost five decades. Amos received an MSLS from Catholic University in Washington, DC. Among other work, she has published two books, the Black Seminoles, History of a Freedom-Seeking People, and Those Who Returned, The History of the Afro-Brazilian Returnees in West Africa in the 19th Century. And finally, author of Washington, D.C. Housing Co-ops, Steve McEvick lives in a mid-sized co-op in Adams Morgan. He is proud to be a native Washingtonian. Now retired, he explores the many aspects of Washington's civic and cultural history. Steve is a board member of the DC Cooperative Housing Coalition and also belongs to the Historical Society of Washington, DC. He's a strong believer in the concept of housing cooperatives and considers them good for a city's environment and good homes for city residents. On behalf of Politics and Prose, please join me in welcoming Brianna A. Thomas, Alcione M. Amos, and Steve McEvitt. Thank you all. Thank you, Julia. So excited for this talk. Thank you, um, Politics and Prose, and everyone that's tuning in, and my fellow Arcadia authors. Um, so I'm just going to start off with introducing my book, Black Broadway in Washington, D.C., which is right here. Um, my book is centered around the Black Broadway era, which is the greater area, greater Washington area of U Street. And so it, uh, the Black Railway era is from the 1900s to the mid 1900s, where everything was pretty much black funded, black owned, black uh, educated, it was black initiatives. At that time, there were more than 300 black owned businesses just on the U Street corridor alone. And so that's the core of my book. My book journals the history of U Street from the time of slavery up until the recent times that we now see gentrification. And so um, that's pretty much the summary of my book. That's just a short introduction. Um, so I'm gonna pass it on to Alcione. Um, thank you very much. Um, my book, uh, Berry Farm Hughesdale of Anacostia, talks about the creation of this African-American community across the Anacostia River in 1867, right after the Civil War. And uh, the reason that the community was created by the Freedmen's Bureau was because uh, during the Civil War between 50,000 uh, and 60,000 African-Americans had come into Washington. As the uh, reports went at the time, as soon as the uh, US Army went into Virginia, people that could leave left any way they could. They could walk in and on horses, carts, jumping on a train, jumping on a boat, coming to Washington, because they thought if they came to Washington, they would get freedom. And uh, eventually, yes, they got freedom, but it was very difficult for them to find housing because there was absolutely no housing in Washington in general. 
and there was no housing for refugees, especially African-American refugees. So uh, uh, General Howard went to visit one of these settlements in downtown Washington on K Street and asked them uh, what would, they, told them they had to leave. First thing he said, you have to leave. And they said, what are we going to do? Where are we going to go? And he asked them, what would make you self-sufficient? And they always screamed, give us land. Because these people were rural people. If they had land, they knew what to do. They knew how to take care of themselves. So uh, the general conceived the idea of buying a big farm on the other side of the river, thus the name of the community, Berry Farm, and uh, create, uh, you know, plot the lots and open the streets. And uh, eventually there were um, 500, uh, no, 375 acres that he bought. He had 356 one acre lots. These were huge lots. And also they made available number for them to buy and, and build their houses. Now I want to make sure that everybody understands nothing was free of charge. Everything was paid for. And the other thing I wanted to say is that do not confuse Berry Farm Hillsdale with Berry Farm Dwellings, which is very much now in the news. Berry Farm Dwellings was built on the footprint of Berry Farm Hillsdale, but in 1942, and it was created for, uh, again, it was again a, a, a problem of housing for African-Americans. Uh, many uh, African-American workers came to Washington during the Second World War, and there was no housing for them. So this was one of the, uh, you know, uh, neighborhoods that were created for them. And it was just 10% of the original Berry Farm Hillsdale. And another little bit about the name, the hyphenated name. People were very upset that the neighborhood was named after a family that had owned enslaved people. And they uh, wanted to change the name and they proposed uh, several names until Hillsdale was proposed and approved in the 1870s. But very interestingly, it never appeared in the maps. Uh, it never, uh, you know, to this date, if you buy a house, on the footprint of the neighborhood, the original neighborhood, when you get your deed, it says Berry Farm. So we had this long discussion at the museum. What are we going to do? What name are we going to use? And we eventually came up with the hyphenated name. And of course, I explained that, you know, why of that in, in, the, uh, in the, the book. Both names are historic, but, you know, you, you, need, you need to pay homage to the original name. And uh, that's the beginning of the story, but the story goes on for a hundred years. The neighborhood developed in a very successful neighborhood. There were lots of interesting things that happened there. And uh, pretty much in the 1960s, uh, the identity had been subsumed into an acostia. And, and today, if you, know, you, you don't talk about, uh, uh, you know, uh, the different areas of Anacostia. There are several neighborhoods within what people call Anacostia. But uh, that, that's the history that's in the book, a hundred years of history. And it's, is it my turn? Uh, hello, I'm Steve McEvitt. And as you see there, here's the book. It is a um, wonderful cover. Uh, Arcadia does wonderful covers. Um, uh, the book is about um, uh, the, uh, the housing cooperatives of Washington, D.C. And uh, a lot of people in the country, uh, across the country think of New York as uh, the co-op center. And it really is the largest uh, collection of, of uh, housing co-ops. But D.C. has quite a number. And uh, over the past century, uh, there have been uh, periods of growth with the um, with, with housing co-ops and uh, the uh, the hook for the book uh, uh, was basically 1920 to 2020 uh, because in 1920 uh, the uh, some real estate people got together uh, and developed uh, some of the foundational pieces of uh, housing co-ops where they uh, 
uh, people uh, put an investment in. These, these are owner occupied. Uh, they, they put a down payment in and they're uh, essentially earning equity the same way that single family um, uh, homeowners would, would do. And uh, there was a big burst in the 1920s uh, of uh, these, these buildings and the, then the depression stopped everything. And after World War II, there, were, there was another uh, growth where um, a lot of uh, apartment buildings, solid apartment buildings were converted and there was new construction. And then after home rule in 1973, there was another spurt where uh, buildings were converted and uh, there were some new, new buildings also built. Uh, Co-ops uh, uh, share the same sort of life as condos do. Uh, there's a difference between them. Condos uh, came about in the 1960s where it was easier for the real estate people to sell them uh, because uh, with, it, with a housing co-op, um, the, 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 the uh, members of the cooperative uh, own shares in the corporation that owns the building and those sh their share gives them their apartment and they can do the, the same things that you can do in a condo. Uh, but there is a little more control with a, with a cooperative so that um, they, they, uh, the cooperative itself can, can make sure the building works well. Now, um, co-ops are still vibrant today. Uh, there actually uh, have been co-ops after 2000 that were uh, built in the city. Um, condos are, are more common now but, uh, but co-ops are too. Uh, let's see if there were, if there's anything that I, I missed I want to hit. Uh, I think they're great for the city. They provide um, uh, people with an interest in the, um, in the city and uh, in, um, in their neighborhoods. So. Great. Uh, so those were the introductions to all of our wonderful books uh, from Arcadia Publishing. And the topic of discussion for tonight is culture and community in the capital city. And all of our books touch on that in different ways. Um, you have Steve's book that talks about these housing and the co-ops, which I think is very interesting. Just some of the things you were saying, I'm like, oh, I wanna know more about co-ops specifically in the U Street area. And Alcione, you mentioned actually um, a point that I wanna pick up from is I didn't know that the Berry Farm Hillsdale community was started by the Freedmen's Bureau. And that's really connected to the core of uh, Black Broadway because Howard University is in the U Street corridor. And uh, Freedmen's Bureau was what started uh, Howard University. That's how it came about. And Howard University is actually a big part of what made Black Broadway what it was. Um, and some of the heroes from Black Broadway, just so that you can kind of know exactly what I'm talking about, uh, Duke Ellington, he grew up on T Street. Um, everyone knows Duke Ellington, the famed jazz artist. We have Carter G. Woodson, who's the actual father of Black history and the second Black person to earn a doctorate um, in history actually. Um, he was on U Street. He had an office on U Street. Some of his, he taught at Dunbar High School. Uh, and Dunbar High School was actually the first high school for Black people in the nation. So that's how, um, how pivotal Black Broadway was and how pivotal U Street still is today, that there's so many first initiatives. There's so many um, heroes and people that we know of. It was a huge jazz era, but I thought it was just so interesting to hear that the Freedmen's Bureau played a part in starting the Berry Farm Hill Cell community just like they played a part in starting Howard University. So I, did you want to um, expound upon that a little more? Yes, actually, uh, General Howard got $52,000 that had been set aside to create uh, educational institutions for African Americans. And he paid that to buy uh, the Berry Farm to build the settlement. Then with the money that uh, people paid back, as I explained, everything was paid for. The lots were sold for 350, uh, $150 to $300, depending on location. And some people bought more than, than a lot. Uh, he got the money back and then he opened, you know, invested it to, into, uh, it was uh, uh, Howard University and two other, two other institutions, which I don't remember the name right now. So there was definitely that early connection but there was a later connection that is very interesting. 
the second African-American woman to receive a PhD was born and raised in, 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 in Berry Farm, Hillsdale, uh, Georgiana Simpson. And uh, she, uh, you know, her early education was all in the community. And then she went to M Street High School, which was the famous African-American high school in Washington. And then she went on for a long career teaching uh, German in the public schools of Washington, DC. And finally, she was hired by uh, Howard University to teach at Howard. And she became a, a, a teacher of uh, you know, German at Howard University. And I'm sure a lot of people from Berry Farm Hillsdale went to Howard and uh, studied there. But she, she probably would be the most famous of them. Yeah, she's uh, definitely a big uh, figure in my book. Uh, her, along with Anna Julia Cooper, um, actually bring it to more modern times. Another person that went to Number High School who actually wrote the foreword for my book and is a well-known uh, activist and the representative for Washington, D.C. is Cong Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton. She actually went to Number High School. She grew up in the U Street Corridor. I had the opportunity of interviewing her for my book. And um, she just has so many great just accounts and stories of her time working at SNCC and um, all that she's done for DC over the years and continues to do as, you know, DC and the fight for statehood and things like that. But yeah, Dunbar is a huge part of the history of DC. And um, as we're bringing it to today's times, you still see that Dunbar is still around within the U Street corridor. And so that's just interesting that how um, different people from history or different heroes, as I like to call them, still um, tie into different neighborhoods of DC. And I think that maybe, Steve, you could expound upon that about how the housing and maybe these early alley dwellings or how people kind of spread out uh, in the community that you grew up in Berry uh, Farms in Hillsdale, but then you ended up going to school on M Street. So could you talk about how the co-ops maybe plays a part in that? Uh, some. Um, because, oh, by the way, I, I like what you were saying about about the, um, the 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 native roots of U Street and and all all of the people that that are so connected to DC. And one thing about uh, the co-ops uh, when they started uh, based in um, in earnest in 1920, uh, there were co-ops uh, before 1920, uh, but they were usually a uh, a one-off sort of thing. It was a one-type. Uh, a piece where some people got together, some friends, and and might might have uh, built a, a 12 unit building. But in 1920, it became um, uh, available uh, with real estate, and it um, it uh, spread through initially with uh, buildings that were already had been built after 1905 when they were modern buildings. And they were they were uh, converted to co-ops, and uh, so they were they were basically uh, uh, the the middle income people, and then the high end, and they um, they um, uh, they shared all the same uh, sort of, uh, uh, of of issues and uh, things to be resolved, and dealing with your neighbors in, in a in a community uh, method. Um, it's, it's funny though, the, I, I don't go into it in great detail, but uh, the uh, uh, one thing that is of, uh, the, the, that we're talking about right now is, is the, the, uh, the, the issue of um, racial uh, disparities in neighborhoods and, and all of that. So after uh, World War II, uh, there were uh, some conversions, uh, especially some right in the U Street area. On, at 14th and R, there was the Hay Warden and some other buildings that were, um, uh, they were middle-class um, African-Americans. And then um, as uh, the, uh, after 1954 with the um, desegregation and all, there were, um, there was the white flight, uh, but there were quite a number of uh, people in housing co-ops wanted to fight the, the white flight and uh, wanted, they had their homes here and they wanted to stay and were progressive. But then also, if I may say, there were some that were thinking that their building would be a fortress of, of uh, whiteness. I hate to say this, uh, but uh, that all 
is gone. It's been gone for decades. And uh, the uh, uh, co-ops um, are, are, do not discriminate. Um, and they don't want to discriminate. Um, one issue that, uh, this is a little off track of DC, but you, people may have read that it, there were some co-ops in New York City that didn't want certain people in their building. Uh, that was not a, 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 um, an ethnic issue. It was an issue of not wanting the nuisance of, of some people in their building. That, that is uh, gone from, from DC. If I, if I, if I'm, I hope I'm being clear, uh, but uh, uh, the whole issue that, that uh, grew out of uh, the, the, the first batch of co-ops, especially the larger ones where the building might be 50, 60 units, and then later on there might be 200, 400 units, is how you have a community where you set up rules for people to, to live with that are, are reasonable and, and fair workable. And so it's really interesting. That's part of what the book covers and talks about. Uh, I wanted to bring up one thing that I think it's interesting about all three books. All three books, in a way, talk about housing. Uh, mine, of course, is the earliest, 1867. Then, uh, you know, the beginning of, of uh, cooperatives, uh, like Steve's talking about in the 1920s. And then, uh, Brianna, you talk about gentrification in your book and what happened to, you know, uh, U Street. And when I arrived in Washington, D.C. in 1972, just four years after the riots, uh, I remember going there and being so sad about the way the, you know, the whole area looked. And uh, it stayed like that for so long. And then, of course, when it changed, it changed in a way that was very sudden and, and not necessarily inclusive. <laughs> uh, you know, a lot of, of people that had been there are not there anymore. So uh, I, think, I think it's interesting, this connection between our three books, which are so completely different, but uh, still bring up the, the, the problem of housing in Washington, which continues to this day. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um... I def my last chapter is about gentrification in my book um, because that's what U Street looks like today. It's totally different. As I started off saying, the core of the book is the glory days of Black Broadway where you could go down the street and see a celebrity. I mean, literally a celebrity, right? There's all of these people, Black people creating and owning their own. Industrial Savings Bank is the first Black-owned bank in D.C. Bench Chili Bowl is there, Black-owned serving half smokes and still around today. Um, and it was just the core of nightlife and business and just education. You had Black barbershops and Black lawyers and Black doctors. Thurgood Marshall, who was uh, the famed student of Charles Hamilton Houston at Howard University, he wins the case for Brown versus Board of Education, which brings, as Steve mentioned, this 1954 desegregation. And for U Street, although there was so much uh, a breeding ground of activism in the quarter, it actually ended up separating what they built, right? So because uh, what made Black Broadway so special was that in other parts of DC, Blacks could not own their own. They could not, uh, you know, open their own businesses without having issues with, with banks who didn't want to loan, their, loan them money. They couldn't just live wherever they wanted to live. But on U Street, the Jim Crow laws were not the same. They had freedom to have their own. And so we see this in 1954 when desegregation happens and people begin to spread out. And as Steve, you mentioned this white flight, right? And so you have all these black people who are moving out to the suburbs, they're going to Prince George's County, they're moving out of state because now they've got education, they're free to open their own, they've made some money now. And now this community is left with, uh, not that it wasn't diverse before, because although there were a lot of Black-owned businesses, there were still a lot of 
other uh, cultures, other ethnicities on U Street, which I know a lot of times that point gets left out. But we see this now change from what used to be all Black people to now a lot of Black people have moved out. And then from there, you see uh, the assassination of MLK, as you mentioned, Alcione, and that creates these the 1968 riots. So you have desegregation, which is the first white flight of people dispersing and spreading out. Then you have these riots that literally destroy the corridor. Businesses are burned down. It's nothing like rub nothing but rubble. And as you said, you can remember how it stayed up literally a mess for years until you see uh, Marion Barry come in and he wants to uh, open up this Reeves Center on 14th and U. And um, I got a chance to interview former DC Mayor Anthony Williams for my book as well. And he talks about how he had this big pledge, you know, to get 100,000 new residents into DC. And the thing is that was good because DC was crime ridden. It was a crack epidemic at the time. Um, and this is the time known as Chocolate City. And so there are a lot of black people there, but it's impossible it's not safe and it doesn't even look appealing. And so when this revitalization of U Street happens, it's a good thing at first, you have the metro construction, right? But then what is supposed to attract new people attracts people that also are not the people that built what U Street is known for. And so now we have high property taxes, which I'm sure you may mention in your book, Steve, but the people that actually fought to have a free U Street or to have their own, now you have a city that looks nice, but the question is who is the city for now? And so um, just statistically speaking, Washington DC, um, there was a study done in 2019, but from the time period of 2002 to 2016, we see that Washington DC has the most displacement in, uh, for any American city, the most displacement. And so it's a literally a, a hub of gentrification. And for my book, Black Broadway, that's kind of the ending uh, question, right, of the book of what will U Street look like 10 years from now? What will U Street look like 20 years from now when I can point back to a time in the 1950s where there's 300 black owned businesses right on the corridor. And now in U Street, there's only three remaining black owned businesses from the Black Broadway era. That's Industrial Savings Bank, that's Ben's Chili Bowl, and that's Lee's Flower and Card Shop. And so, as you mentioned, you know, and the topic for tonight is the culture of the capital and the community. And so I don't know if you all want to expound on that or what it looks like now in, in modern times. Yeah, I, I wanted to, if I can just quickly bring up the uh, role that the residents of Berry Farm Hills they had on the desegregation of schools in Washington, D.C. Perhaps, perhaps I don't think many people know that the center of the fight to desegregate schools in the 1950s in Washington was in Berry Farm Hillsdale. And uh, they had meetings at uh, the AME uh, you know, church on what is now Martin Luther King Avenue, which was Nichols, Nicholson Avenue, Avenue at the time. And uh, the, um, the parents you know, that were fighting for this desegregation were very, putting their jobs on the line so to speak, because if the employers knew that they were active in, the, in this fight to desegregate the schools, they could be fired. And uh, they, they uh, in uh, hundreds of them signed a petition. And when I looked at the addresses, most of them were from Berry Farm dwellings, were residents at Berry Farm dwellings, which by then was a, a low rental community. And so uh, this is an interesting part of the connection again of uh, you know the free books, the segregation in Washington. Uh, one thing that, that you mentioned about U Street, I thought was uh, uh, the, the change in the, uh, the ownership of the, uh, of the uh, businesses, the properties. That's really unfortunate because that goes to uh, uh, it, it's it's in my book on co-ops, but it's it's something that I really am I'm very uh, much interested in is the idea of communities and keeping a, a sense of community, and uh, that's one thing that co-ops do uh, or they should do, and most of them do, uh, and and to have a history uh, that you are aware of and that you care about. Um, it's a difficult uh, situation, um, not just with U Street, but all around. 
where people are coming in and they don't have any um, any sense of uh, where they are. You know, it could be could be here, it could be Tyson's Corner, it could be Silver Spring, and you know, it's really a shame that um, that, that we're not we're not uh, able to foster that a whole lot more. Uh, can I say one thing about about uh, co-ops? Is that uh, one of the uh, the biggest uh, uh, promoters, uh, I would say promoter, but he also believed in co-ops was Edmund J. Flynn. And the company that he started is still the main one in DC that manages the, uh, the record keeping for, uh, for housing co-ops, uh, at least the, um, the owner occupied market rate co-ops. And uh, one thing that he really pushed for um, and uh, almost succeeded was in developing a community that was more than just a, a box, a, a home. It was a, 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 he planned garden communities where they had uh, amenities, uh, there were swimming pools were planned, all sorts of things where they were, they were good for uh, the neighborhood, good for the city, and then good for the residents. Uh, the depression stopped uh, several large projects. If anyone knows in DC, there's Tilden Gardens, which is on Connecticut Avenue, um, upper, you know, going up Connecticut Avenue. And that was completed almost the way it was designed, not quite, but it really, it took 10 years because of the depression. So the depression really did a whole, it did a lot of damage to, uh, to the country in a lot of ways that, that um, you know, it's more than just history, it really hurt. Um, but anyway, so Edmund Flynn uh, really pushed this idea of community. And, uh, you know, I think that if the city really uh, wanted to, uh, uh, to, to, to open up the idea more, they could do that in the sense where, where they're, they're getting um, some of the, um, as, as, as you pointed out, we still have the, um, the, the, the people in poverty, uh, mostly African Americans. And to work toward, um, you know, where they are, they they do get a home, more than just a place to live, that that could be something that the city could plan. Yeah, I, I think that's a really good point um, that you just said that that uh, people of color specifically that they are able to have a home and not just a place to live. Um, and I think that just what you said at the start of this of people are moving into the area and don't know where they are, right? Don't even are unaware of the history or the people that came before them. And I think um, why I wrote this book, I know, and I'm sure all of you have some sort of, you know, you're a Washingtonian native. I'm actually born and raised Maryland girl. Um, and Alciona, you moved to Washington, you said in the seventies, but you have, you know, these memories of DC. There's a connection to the city in some way, shape or form. And I didn't live through, you know, desegregation. I didn't live through the jazz era in the 1920s, but um, my introduction to U Street was my grandmother. And because I'm actually dedicated my book to her because she's the first one to share her U Street memories with me. And she would tell me how she, you know, would go to the Howard Theater to watch a show or go to the Republic uh, to see a movie or the Lincoln Theater, which is still on the corridor today, you know, to see a movie or she go dancing at Crystal Caverns or the Caves. And if some of you are familiar with U Street, you, these names will sound familiar, but she always had positive memories about U Street. It wasn't just a place, like you said, to live, but it was a home. It was it was happy. It was a tight knit community where everybody knew everyone, and there was just this spirit of of just um, of community. This spirit of family, right? And I think that we see what we're seeing more than ever is when people, new people, come into the area, which of course we love. We welcome everybody, but um, let's make sure that we're still paying homage to the history, and let's make sure that we're not kicking people out. Uh, one of the quotes that I have in my book comes from a woman I interviewed, Wanda Henderson, who has a shop um, in the Eustace Quarter, a hair salon, and her quote is, "You know, I just don't want to push nobody out." In other words, I'm perfectly fine with having new clients. I'm perfectly fine with seeing a diverse neighborhood. And I definitely want the crime to go away and my trash to be cleaned up off the streets. But why, in order to have a clean neighborhood, to have a safe neighborhood, does that mean we now have to push the people that were here out of the neighborhood? Yeah, I, I have been in Washington since 1972. 
and I have seen it all. <laughs> I, I wasn't here for the riots, I missed that, but I saw, you know, how it was, uh, you know, and, and uh, how it was desolate, actually it was very desolate, the downtown area, and how it started changing and changing. Uh, but then what surprised me was how quickly it went in the, in the uh, 1990s and uh, the early 2000s, it was like wildfire, you know, suddenly, you know, you went to, to a place and, and uh, you went back a year later, it was completely changed. And of course, yes, you want, uh, you know, as, a, as an owner of a house in Washington, D.C., uh, you want, uh, you know, the economy in the city to be well and, and you want crime to go down and so on and so on. But you also feel that people get displaced and, uh, you know, cannot stay where the, you know, generations of their families live. And that happened in Barry Farm Hills Day, but in a different way, it was not actually um, uh, gentrification. Uh, people, uh, you know, start selling the lots, these huge lots to developers, like the, you know, grandmother died and, you know, I don't want to keep the house. I have moved someplace else. And they would sell those huge lots that had only one house. And the developer would come and build a building with several apartments, you know, usually two or three floors, but several apartments, you can build a lot in one acre. Or the builder would buy two or three lots and build, build practically, you know, almost a hundred apartments. So where there used to be a three houses, there were now a hundred apartments. No services followed. And this was happening in the 60s and 70s. So the neighborhood kept going down and down and down because it was overcrowded and there were no services. The schools were always 150% over capacity. And, uh, you know, and there was, uh, you know, no uh, medical services and uh, the stores left, you know, no, no uh, mom, a, a few mom and pop stores, but no, uh, you know, big uh, supermarkets or anything like that. So the community started uh, unraveling and, and this was not just the area where Berry Farm Hills Day was located, the whole area of Anacostia. And uh, the other thing that was very unfair to, to Berry Farm Hills Day, the houses, the old houses, which were frame houses, were not considered historic. So they were all torn down. While the frame houses in, 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 in other types of housing in, in Anacostia, historic Anacostia, the center of uh, historic Anacostia, which by the way, was a white neighborhood in, until the 1950s. Uh, they were, uh, you know, considered historic and rece rece uh, received the uh, preservation. So um, Barry Farm Hillsdale has suffered a lot and, and uh, you know, it actually has practically disappeared. There are no, there are two, two buildings from the late 19th century, everything else that was built you know, from 1867 to 1890s disappeared. And uh, so it, it's a different story. It's not the gentrification, but the, the destruction was similar. And uh, Steve, did you have anything to add? And then I'm gonna open it up for questions. Well, just that, uh, that that was a, a very sad uh, 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 tale of, uh, of events at Barry Farms. Uh, and uh, uh, it, I believe it's played out in other uh, areas too. And it is, um, uh, to my mind, it, it goes to, uh, to people. Uh, there are, uh, from, from right after the Civil War, there were people with good intentions. And all through the last, up till today, there, are, there have been people, are people with good intentions, and there are people who don't care at all. They just want the money. And it's unfortunate that so often people, I, I'm sorry, I'm going off, people with the money are able to, to uh, to, to set the, the tone of where something's going, and it's really, really unfortunate. So, so I'm glad that uh, that you've got the book on Berry Farms because the more people know about our history, the more people can 
look at the present and see what we need to do. Awesome, awesome. Well, I'm glad that I had the opportunity to hear about these awesome books. Um, I just think it's great how they all connect in some way, shape or form. And it's just cool, you know, the history and then seeing the modern times and the common themes. Um, some of them are still similar, right? You know, wanting to get this history and the knowledge so you know where you've come from and where you live. But also the common theme of that things look very different than they did um, you know, in the 1900s and prior uh, to the 1900s. And so that's just something something to think about as you're thinking about, you know, picking up one of these books and reading them. But I want to open up the floor for questions from our, um, our viewers. Uh, thanks again for tuning in, everybody. And so if you just put your questions in the Q&A, uh, we can go ahead and answer them for you. And I'm just going to... Um, just pick a couple and uh, anyone can answer if you like. Uh, so I'll start with, with this one. It says, uh, what's the author's prescription for housing and culture in DC? What can we be doing? And that's, I think that's a great way to tie it in since we just ended on how uh, gentrification in the city has changed a lot. So Steve, would you like to answer that? I will try. <laughs> That's, that's so broad. Um, I think um, I, I think I'll, at the very beginning, it's education for yourself. You know, just knowing if you live in DC, if you live in the DC area, you really want to be aware of uh, what is happening in your neighborhood and uh, what the reasonable possibilities are. Uh, and uh, I, I don't really like to make it into a good versus bad. But uh, in fact, we do have people who um, are, they're doing good, they're well-intentioned, and there are some people who just don't care. And you should be aware of, of, of that. Um, but also uh, look and see, read out on uh, what it has been, what, what some of the proposals are, what we can do going into the future. Because we're always looking at what's happening next week or uh, six months from now. We should be looking at what happens 20 years from now. All right, uh, that was a very good point, Steve, on looking what happens 20 years from now. I actually, uh, when I interviewed Mayor Williams, former DC mayor, he was talking about in the construction that, you know, it doesn't just happen overnight. These are plans that are pre-planned 20, 30 years in advance. So um, that's a very good point. Uh, so we have another question and maybe uh, Alcione, you can answer this uh, because you moved to DC from Brazil and I'm sure your book has some common themes, but it says, are there themes in your books that will speak to readers outside of the DC metropolitan Virginia area? Yes, in my book, there is one. Uh, Very Farmhill's Day was uh, divided by the building of the Suitland Parkway, also in the 1940s during the Second World War, divided the community in two. And that was actually, I traced the beginning of the, the destruction of the community to that because not only hundreds of people were displaced but and the hundreds of houses were destroyed, but you know the flow of the community from one side east to the west side was completely destroyed. And as I was researching the book, I realized that this happened everywhere in African-American communities in Washington, everywhere. Uh, in the 60s, finally, there was a movement against uh, you know, the building of, of uh, the freeway in Washington that was going to go through uh, you know, and destroy everything and you know, make Washington look like uh, Los Angeles, I guess. But, uh, as I went to different cities, uh, you know, to uh, give talks or to do research or whatever, there was always an African American neighborhood that was divided by a freeway that was built through it, and uh, and then uh, you know discussions with uh, uh, people at the museum. They said, "Yeah, that that it was a common thing," and it, it it seems to me that it was intentional that uh, you know. The, the engineers will, would look on the map and say, 
which is the poorest neighborhood that you know people are not going to be able to complain or do anything about it. And you can go in and, and do eminent domain and kick everybody out and, and build the, 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 the freeway with, without too much trouble. And um, so I think people from other places will realize, well, that happened to my community too. I, you know, in the 50s or 60s or 70s, this freeway was built through my neighborhood and destroyed uh, a lot of it. So that is a, a common theme. And the other theme is, um, you know, the, the, the African-Americans that were more affluent leaving the community in the, in after, you know, the, in the 60s, after they could buy or rent in the suburbs. That happened, uh, you know, my uh, husband uh, uh, was African-American and he lived in a community in Atlanta that was all African-American. When I arrived in 72 to marry him, I came to the United States to get married. We went to visit his family. It was an all African-American community that had everything. It had college, uh, you know, all the commerce that needed everything. And, uh, and then, in the 60s and 70s, people just moved out. And the last time I was there in uh, the early 2000s with my son, who was then already an adult, and, and uh, we couldn't find a cab driver who would drive us to the house where you know his father had grown up. And uh, you know because the neighborhood had gone, gone down so much because people just had abandoned it. So there is a lot in the book that, that I have written that has other African-American neighborhoods in the country will find something in common with their history. Yeah, I think that'll tie right into another question we had um, from Ann Powers. Um, it says, could you speak to what you mean by gentrification? And um, I think I could answer that uh, very quickly, and we kind of talked about it, but gentrification in its most technical term um, is real estate investments uh, coming into a predominantly low income area. And it's usually accompanied by an influx of middle class uh, residents or more affluent residents um, moving into the area. And the result of that is lower income of the poor residents that are there. They are I mean, I don't really want to use the term force, but kind of that's what happens. They are pushed out of the area. And the reason they're pushed out is because they cannot afford to live there anymore because the property is uh, now more expensive. And so that's that's what we mean by gentrification. And as you mentioned, uh, just now answering the question, this isn't something that happens just in DC. This is in San Diego, it's in Los Angeles, it's in Chicago, you know, this happens. It's a common theme in cities in America. Uh, so I'll move on to another question here. Uh, let's see. Okay, I have one question and this one will be for Steve to answer. It says uh, from Chris uh, Gastier, it says, what percentage of district residents live in cooperatives today? Uh, it's, it's in the tens of thousands. I, I don't have an exact number. Uh, I've tried, and several other people have tried. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the DC uh, Cooperative Housing Coalition has about 72 members, and that's uh, about uh, three quarters of the, uh, the, uh, the regular um, owner-occupied uh, market rate co-ops in the city. There are several co-ops uh, that are just, uh, they're, they're just, uh, very quiet, and they they belong to their own little group. And then there are what are called limited equity co-ops, where they uh, people really don't don't um, gain uh, home ownership in, in the building. Um, so I don't know the exact amount. It's in the um, uh, around fifty thousand uh, of you know, perhaps a little less than that uh, of the of the city residents. Okay. Um, I think we have a time for a couple more. I can answer. Um, this one is from Matthew Busby. It uh, says, I missed the part about the Jim Crow laws were not implemented in U Street, but other places in DC. Why and how? What was the actual uh, geography area or geographic area of U Street, neighborhoods surrounding U Street? Um, so 
Uh, great question, Matthew, actually. <laughs> but uh, when I'm talking about the U Street Corridor specifically, I'm talking about um, it's stretching uh, down 16th Street, about a dozen blocks, uh, encompassing, obviously, U Street is the main strip, uh, S Street, T Street, V Street, uh, parts of Florida Avenue. If you go into the Shaw area, that is um, more of a little part of Rhode Island up into Q Street. And so it's pretty, a couple of blocks now, well, more than a couple. Um, and so that's really the geography of the U Street corridor itself. Uh, now the more modern term, it includes the Cardoza Shaw area. And if you've ever ridden the Metro, you've seen these stops before, um, but, uh, why there were Jim Crow laws in other places and not on U Street is a great question. So there were Jim Crow laws everywhere in DC, including U Street, but because U Street was formed um, as a predominantly African American community, starting from the time of slavery, there were these things called contraband camps. And contraband camps, I'm a very uh, quickly, contraband camps came because of uh, refugee slaves. And so these runaway slaves, they would end up in D.C. Uh, because we uh, D.C. is positioned between Virginia and Maryland, two slave holding states at the time. Uh, we're talking about pre-Civil War and into the Civil War. And so out of these contraband camps, we had uh, initiatives like the Freedmen's Bureau, which we mentioned earlier in the discussion today. Out of the Freedmen's Bureau, we had housing for uh, Black people that were already in the city. And out of that, you have uh, places like Howard University that creates this now um, community where things can be built. And so Black people that became freed slaves, they started to become cooks and seamstress and waitresses, and they started to really learn how to do things for themselves. And then we end up with a community known as U Street, where it's predominantly African American. And so there were Jim Crow laws in DC and there was still segregation in, in problems, but because it was a black neighborhood, if you think about a whites only sign and a blacks only sign, it's a black neighborhood. And so U Street, they didn't have to deal with that problem as much. And also you had Howard University. Um, another point to think about is that Maryland was still very heavily segregated. And so a lot of people, they would stick to staying in DC rather than being in Maryland or being in Virginia. And U Street specifically, when we're talking about Jim Crow laws and things like that. An interesting fact is uh, the theaters, they were unsegregated. And so when you think about the big names that came to the Howard Theater, it wasn't all black people in the seats. There were black people, there are white people. Um, there's actually one of my favorite photos, which I didn't get a chance to put in my book, but it's Howard University students walking First Lady uh, Roosevelt to like one of the classes or something. So that just tells you how much of a mixed community it was. And so I will move on to a next, uh, another question. And I think we maybe only have like um, three minutes here. So another question that we have, uh, this is from Art and this is specifically for Steve. It says, do you think that co-ops and their emphasis on resident owners as, oppo as opposed to renting out are thus able to contribute to a strong sense of community and neighborhood involvement? This is, uh, this is one issue that, uh, that co-ops and condos and any sort of uh, uh, multifamily, multi-unit uh, uh, building uh, has to uh, has to deal with because uh, uh, there certainly there needs to be a place in the city for um, for rental units. Uh, but if your your home uh, becomes more than fifty percent rental, uh, it it changes the character of the building where it's not your you, you don't have your your friends your neighbors and uh, they don't have the, uh, the same interest in the building. Oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes. So yes, I think that uh, having a building uh, as a co-op be uh, predominantly or uh, completely uh, owner-occupied is good for the neighborhood because it does have people involved uh, or they have the opportunity to be involved as, as, their, life, as their life goes on, they they grow into the neighborhood, and that's very important. Uh, that's that's an issue that uh, that uh, is uh, maybe the, the most the most you know I'd say it's the most uh, talked about issue in condos and co-ops right now. 
And I think we have about 30 seconds left, and this will be for um, Alcione. It is from Gail Dunn Kaufman. It says, where is the Douglas home in relation to Berry Farm in historic Anacostia? Sorry, I could use a map. <laughs> yeah. No worries. Well, uh, the, uh, the Douglas home is a square in the middle of historic Anacostia, which was a white neighborhood, as I explained. And... Uh, he didn't live in Berry Farm Hillsdale. He went to Berry Farm Hillsdale. He talked at the church. He taught at, at uh, uh, church school. He gave uh, develop, you know, many to uh, speeches and so on and so on, but he didn't live in Berry Farm Hillsdale. Two of his sons lived for a little bit in Berry Farm Hillsdale, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's far away. I would say a mile or two away and uh, he probably was one of the very few, one or two or three African-Americans who lived in uh, Anacostia at that time, because it was completely close to, to African-Americans at the time. Okay, I think that's all the time we have for questions. I'm going to pass this over to um, Julia. Thank you all so much. We could spend another hour or two discussing these three great books. Um, they're so distinct. We hope everyone will really follow the link in the chat to get their copies. Um, many thanks again to Brianna A. Thomas, Alcione M. Amos, and Steve McEvitt, and our audience out there tuning in with all of your engaging and thoughtful questions. Your patronage and dedication enable us to bring you this type of live programming, and we simply wouldn't be able to do it without the book sales to support it. So go ahead and follow that link in the chat or head on over to politics-prose.com to get your copies of Black Broadway in Washington, D.C., Berry Farm Hillsdale in Anacostia, a historic African-American community, and Washington, D.C. housing co-ops. While you're there, scroll over to our events calendar to check out the latest and greatest from politics and prose. And from our shelves to yours, we hope you're out there staying strong, staying safe, and staying well read. We'll see you next time. Bye. Thank everybody. you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye bye.